doing a brand new series that we're starting today. As you saw up on the screen, it's called Wise Up. And uh, this is a series, we're going through the book of James this month. James is a small book in your New Testament, uh, getting close to the end. And uh, we're gonna be going through each chapter in James. In fact, there's four chapters and there's four weeks in September. So it just seems ordained of God. It's gonna work out great. We're gonna go through chapter one today and uh, chapters two, three, and four the rest of the month. And in fact, my text verse is gonna be out of James one. So if you wanna go to James one in your Bible, you can as we get ready to read our text. But uh, this is a book about faith. It's about living out your faith, living out your faith in a trying and, and difficult world and learning how to persevere in faith and to taming your tongue in faith and submitting to God in your faith and living your faith in such a way that would glorify God. James is one of those guys that uh, tells it the way it is. Uh, he is not, does not sugarcoat. He was actually the first pastor of the, the first church in Jerusalem, so he, he was a pastor, but he, he, uh, he doesn't hold back when he gives us the commands. In fact, there's only 100 and, uh, 108 verses in the whole book of James. And 54 of them, half of them, are very clear commands that he gives us and how to live out this life of faith. Uh, James was the brother of Jesus. Okay, this is not the James that was the disciple of Jesus that you read about in the Gospels. Uh, that was a different James. This James was actually his brother. And the Bible tells us that his brothers actually rejected him as the Messiah. So James didn't even believe that he was the Messiah when, when Jesus was on earth before his death. But in Corinthians, we see that after his resurrection, he actually appeared to James, and James was a believer then. In fact, James being a believer that Jesus is the Messiah is one of the best evidences that Jesus really is who he said he is. I mean, what would it take for you to believe that your brother is the Messiah? It would take a lot, right, to be able to believe that. It was growing up together and, and everything that happens in the home, right? So the fact that James knew that Jesus was the Messiah is a huge testimony to Jesus being who he said he was. And uh, it's, a, it's a great book. It's a, uh, we, we know about James that history tells us, it's not in the Bible, but historians tell us that James was murdered, that he was thrown from the top of the temple because he wouldn't renounce his faith in Jesus. But when he was th landed down, he did not die. And so they actually went down and they beat him to death with clubs. And, the, and the historians tell us that when they were beating him, he was praying for their souls. That's a man that loved Jesus. And he knew there was more to life than just this life. And a wonderful man of God. And we're gonna go through this book this month and I'm really excited about it. Uh, the term wise up, we call it that because if you actually look up the term wise up, what it actually means, it actually means to start to understand a situation or a fact and believe what you hear about it, even if it is difficult or unpleasant. If I could sum up the book of James in your New Testament, I would sum it up by saying wise up. James is telling the church to wise up. This was originally written to the church in the first century, the scattered churches that had scattered probably after Stephen's uh, martyrdom, and it's for us today too. He's telling us to wise up, to believe what we have heard, to understand what we have heard, even when it is difficult or unpleasant. I could tell you the book of James, there's some difficult and even some unpleasant commands that he gives us. So we're gonna be doing that this month. And my text is gonna be out of James 1. I'm gonna ask you to stand with me if you would as we read the word of God together. Just in honor of reading his word, we'll stand together. Uh, verses 22 to 25. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself, do what it says. Some versions say, be doers of the word. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Can someone say amen? Amen, amen. amen. praise God. Let's pray together. The title of my message is Outrageous Faith. Heavenly Father, we do love you today. We thank you so much for your presence in this place, God. We can do nothing apart from you, but with you, there's nothing we can't do. God, I pray that you would transform us today by your word, that it would do what it is set out to do in our lives, God and that this would be, produce fruit in our lives, Lord. We give this time to you. We are desperate for you. Without you, Lord God, there, none of this means anything, but with you, it is life-changing for each and every one of us. So God, would you do what only you can do in these next few moments? And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you, you can be seated. Outrageous faith. So you know, uh, there's a lot of outrage in society right now. I'm sure you probably know that. Social media has definitely exasperated it. 
where everything, a lot of stuff put on social media is meant to make us outraged. There's a lot of outrage in society. In fact, uh, they're calling this the age of outrage that we live in right now. We see it all over the place. You probably see videos of just outrage. You know, there's outrageous crime that is perpetuating around our country. There's outrageous inflation right now that irritates many of us if you're buying a house, uh, especially with the uh, interest rates going up. This is pretty outrageous right now as well. And there's even outrage in the church. There's some outrageous things happening in the church, in the big C church. There's been outrageous scandals that have been put out there in the public for everybody to see. There's been some outrageous hypocrisy that's been out there for everybody to see. But you know something we don't see that's outrageous in the church enough is outrageous faith. The idea of us having outrageous faith, that we would outrageously trust in our God, that we would trust in him in such a way that we'd be completely submitted to him to in such a way that the world would look at us and say, wow, that's outrageous. I can't believe you have that much faith in your God or that you are that determined to go through your trials with joy, as James tells us, or that you have this faith in him and you're submitted to him in such a way that the people outside would say, that's outrageous. The, the reality is that most of the time in the church, what we're doing is we're seeing the church blend in to society, not necessarily sharing in their outrage, hopefully, but we're blending in and not really making a mark in society like we are called to do. And James spends the majority of his letter that he wrote encouraging us to live a type of outrageous faith where we would be challenged and we would challenge those in our life as well. And like I said, the book of James is all about faith. It's all about being all in in faith and having an outrageous faith. He's telling us to wise up. He's telling us to believe what we have heard and to live it out in our life even when it is unpleasant or difficult. You know, Romans tells us that we've all been given a measure of faith. Every one of us has been given faith. It's up to us though to be doers of that faith, to be doers of the word, not just to hear it, but to actually do it in our life. I heard a pastor say not too long ago that uh, too often we in church buy into this idea of mutual fund Christianity. You probably, maybe some of you have heard that term before. I, I hadn't heard it up until this week but it makes a lot of sense. The idea of a, of a mutual fund, if you have a, a 401k or an IRA or you invest in stocks, you probably know what a mutual fund is. A mutual fund is designed to diversify your investment. You don't typically put all your money in one stock because if that stock goes down, you lose your money. So you diversify it and you put it in a bunch of different stocks so that even if a couple of the stocks go down a little bit, the other ones might go up and your money as a whole is growing even though it's kind of fluctuating. And we're always told by investors, hey, if you're gonna put money in the market, diversify. Diversify your portfolio, which is good advice. It's a good idea because it's not nearly as risky if we diversify. But unfortunately, that's something we can also apply in our faith where we become what we would call a mutual fund Christian, where we diversify our faith just like we diversify our money. Like I put some of my faith, I'll put it in God for certain things, but some of my faith, I'm gonna put it in myself because I think I can handle it. Some of my faith, I'm gonna put it in my spouse because maybe she can or he can help me with that. Some of my faith, I'm gonna put in my boss or my career because that's gonna help me financially. We diversify our faith and we're not really meant to diversify our faith. We're not meant to just put our faith in God in certain things like, God, I'll give, you, I'll give you my marriage, God. You can have that, but I can't give you my money. That's too important to me. I gotta make sure I take care of that, God. I'll give you, I'll give you my health because I probably need you to help me with my health, but I'm not giving you my career because if I give you my career, you're probably gonna make me be a missionary in Antarctica or something, All right? So we just wanna control those certain things. We'll give him some things and not others, and we diversify our faith, and we become mutual fund Christians. But you know, God's plan for us is that we would do the exact opposite of the best investor's advice when it comes to your money, is that we would put all of our eggs in one basket, that we would go all in, that we would take the plunge, that we would live our faith in such a way that everything around us, everything in our life comes out of that place of faith in our life, that we don't compartmentalize our faith, but that it is everything, that we are all in. That's the only, th that's the only way to really live out this faith if we're gonna live it according to God's word, to have an outrageous faith that says, I have put all of my eggs in this one basket, and if it doesn't work out, I'm in trouble. Here's the thing, church. When it comes to our faith in God, we should have, it should be in such a way that if, and I'm talking in hyperbole here, if we found out that Jesus was not the Messiah, they found his body, it was mummified somewhere, and he actually didn't raise from the dead, and he wasn't God, and all this that we believe is moot, okay? 
obviously, again, this is complete hyperbole, just to make my point. But if that were to happen, if your whole life was not turned upside down by that revelation or that knowledge, then you're a mutual fund Christian. For me and for you, if, if it is found out that something like that was true, it should make that our whole life has no purpose now. That if we found out that what we believe isn't true, that it affects every area of my life. It affects my finances, it affects my relationships, it affects my well-being, it affects my psyche, it affects my emotions, it affects everything in my life because everything I believed was put into that one basket. Now we praise God because we know that we know that he is the Messiah, that he did rise from the dead, that he is sitting at the right hand of the Father, and that we can put our faith and our trust in him. And we thank God for that. But we are meant to put all of it in him, not to diversify our faith. And this is what James is telling us. And in his text, we get a glimpse of what he's talking about, how this should look in our life for us to be all in, for us to have this outrageous faith. And I'm gonna go through a couple of these and list them out so you can take notes if you want or, or just, just to make it stick in our head a little bit. He starts by saying that we should not be just listeners, but we should be doers of the word. That we should do what it says. Our faith is meant to be active. Our faith is meant to be active, church. It's not just a head knowledge. It's meant, to, it's meant to affect our feet. It's meant to affect our hands. It's meant to affect everything, everywhere we go, that we would be doers of the word, that we would live out this faith in such a way that it permeates from us, that it affects every area of our life, not just Sunday mornings, not just at church events, not just when I'm around my Christian friends, but it would affect everything, that I would be a doer of the word. And he says that we should look intently into the perfect law that brings freedom. Look intently. That means we don't just glance at it. We stare at it. We stare at it awkwardly. You ever been somewhere and you caught somebody staring at you and it was really awkward? Joy and I were in a store a few weeks ago and we were walking through and there was somebody a little ways off and I looked over, I felt like somebody was looking at me. I looked over and somebody was staring at me like big eyed. And when I looked, they looked away. It was kind of weird. And uh, then we walked a little further in the store and we came around the corner and, and, they, and I saw them again. I looked over, they were staring at me again and like really looking at me. And it kind of creeped me out. And, uh, but the, the beauty of being you know, pastor of a church where you don't necessarily know everybody, we just assume, ah, it's probably somebody from New Hope that just doesn't want to come talk to us, but they're intrigued that we're here, you know? Uh, I hope so, otherwise this person was a stalker. Um, but they were looking intently at me. Is which is exactly how we're called to look, to look intently at the word, to look intently at our faith, to focus on our faith so that we don't get distracted from other things. You know, we're, we're getting close to the close to the end of 23. We're, uh, we're in the fall and we're, gonna, you know, we're already planning for Christmas at the church and we're, you know, we're thinking about the end of the year and soon we're gonna be looking back at 2023. And I would challenge you today, like if, if, it was, if today was December 31st and you were looking back at 2023, would you be able to look at that and say, you know what, I looked intently on, upon my faith this year. That my faith was the focus of my life. That it was the first focus, not the only focus, but that it was everything in my life was through the prism of looking at my faith. Because that's the goal. That's what James is telling us, to look intently at it and to focus on it in our life. It's good for us to reflect on those things to see if that's where we're at. And then he goes on to say to continue. I love this word, to continue in our faith. It means to persevere, which James talks about in this, in this chapter as well. To continue in our faith, that it is not just, your faith is not just a one-time thing, it's not coming to an altar and saying a prayer and getting baptized and then doing your thing, but it is a continuation of your life. The, the salvation, the baptism, those are great steps, but those are moments in time that take us into a new journey in life that is about living out this faith, that we are to continue. James is telling us to, to have to be encouraged to continue means it's gonna be tough. You know, we baptized eight people out here last week and it was beautiful. It was a monumental day. We were talking about it for days and it was so great to see young people giving their lives to Jesus and wanting to serve the Lord. But you know what? For all of those that got baptized and for all of us that live our life of faith, that's a great moment and that's a celebratory moment. We celebrate and it's really easy to celebrate and get excited, but the majority of your faith is not lived in the celebration, it's lived in the persevering. It's lived in the continuing in your faith. We love those moments of emotional celebration and faith and we get those, but the majority of the faith is about continuing. 
It is about pushing through. It's about climbing the mountain. There's not as much time sitting at the top of the mountain as there is climbing it. And that's the way God intended it for us. And that's okay. That's why we're being encouraged from James and today to continue in it. That's what it looks like to live this faith. We're to fight for our faith. Continuing is about fighting because to continue in something means there's gonna be resistance. And we are called to fight for our faith, church. Do not be afraid to fight for your faith. Fight for it. Not fight with people, but fight for your faith. Somebody said one time, <laughs> fighting for your faith is you fight like you are the third monkey on the ramp going into Noah's Ark, and brother, it is starting to rain. <laughs> That's how we fight for our faith. One of those monkeys has fallen off that ramp, and it ain't gonna be me, I can tell you that. That's how we are to live this faith. Not just, eh, you know, hope it works out, but really being intentional and diligent in this faith. And then he goes on to say, don't forget. Don't forget. How many of us have forgotten the goodness of God? How many of us have forgotten to live for him and to put him in front of everything we do in our life? I love singing that song, The Goodness of God. I mean, it's, you've heard it on the radio. We, we sing it a lot in church too, and it's, it's, uh, we've heard it a lot. But man, there is just something about it that when you're like, all my life you've been faithful. All my life, you've been so good, God. Remembering his goodness, remembering his faithfulness. It doesn't mean we don't have, we don't have troubles. I can sit here and meditate and, and lament about the troubles in my life, or I can meditate on the faithfulness and the goodness of God. And I choose to meditate on that. In the midst of the, the difficulties, in the midst of the trials, I'm gonna meditate on how good he's been, on how faithful he's been in my life, because he is worthy of it. And James is saying, don't forget, church, what he's done for you. Don't forget who he is. Don't forget the word that's been spoken to you, that has encouraged you and brought you to this place in your faith. Don't forget because it is so easy to forget. There are a million things wanting to take your attention, wanting to get into your memory bank to get you to remember those things instead of the goodness of God. But James is saying, don't forget the goodness of God. And then he finishes by saying, you will be blessed. Praise God. We don't always know what being blessed by God even means. It can mean so many different things, but what I know is that it is a good thing. It is a good thing to be blessed by God. He talks in this passage in my text about uh, looking intently into the perfect law that brings freedom. I believe when we, he's tell, tell, given us these actions to do, the blessing of God is that we walk in the freedom that he designed for us to live in. I've said it many times, you can be a Christian and be as bound up as anybody in the world. You can live enslaved to sin and bondage your whole Christian life. Being a Christian does not guarantee freedom. Being a Christian guarantees you have access to freedom. It's up to you whether or not you're gonna live it. And freedom is reserved for those who are doers of the word. I can tell you that for, for sure. Mutual fund Christians are gonna have a really hard time walking in freedom. Freedom is reserved for those who are living all in and taking the plunge in their faith. We are called to be all in. But you know, for people to go all in on anything, they have to be convinced that they need it, right? For me to go all in on something, I have to be convinced that I have to have that. I can dabble in something even if I'm not sure, but to go all in and put all my eggs in that basket, I've gotta be convinced that I really do need it. There has to be a desperation there that I can't live without this, that if I don't have this, my life's not gonna be right. We have to be convinced to be able to go all in. In fact, where you have made decisions in your life to go deeper in your faith, when you get, if you think back about times that you, you just know you went deeper in that moment in your life and you, you really just gave him more of your life, you surrendered more of your life to him, chances are in that moment, in that season, you were going through something difficult. You were going through a challenge, a health scare, a financial crisis, a relationship scare, a crisis, whatever. And that's what made you go to that place where you're willing to, to go all in because you were desperate. And if that's the case, then the opposite is also true. One of the biggest hurdles, one of the biggest hindrances to going all in in our faith is that we are not desperate in our society. There's not a desperation for God. And we have to live in that, church. That's not something we can escape from. We don't live in a bubble or in a vacuum. We live in a society where there's not a desperation for God. 
partly because we have so many advances in our society. We talk about this all the time too. There are so many niceties that we have that it, it makes it to where we feel like we can kind of get through life on our own in certain ways. Yeah, there's areas I want God, but there's other areas I'm like, I can figure that out. I mean, even in the, in the, in the area of health, a diagnosis 30, 40, 50 years ago that would have been a death sentence for us today is a little more than an inconvenience. A financial, if you're in a financial crisis, you can, you know, you can work more hours, work some more overtime to help you get out of it, or you can get some government assistance, or you can even file bankruptcy. You can do things to get through these things and not really have to trust God. And so we don't get desperate for God. But the desperation for God is what will take us to that place where we're willing to go all in, where we're willing to give him everything. You know, belief in God is declining in the U.S., in fact, it's at an all-time low right now. I'm kind of a stat junkie. I like looking at this stuff. I like to ponder it and even think about like what is causing this, this decline in the belief in God. You, it, you, it, it, you can look at it and see there's a direct correlation to the advancements in society going up and the belief in God going down because there's less of a need because I can figure it out. I have so many resources. So there's not as much of a desperation so it's like, why do I need to believe in God? The more society advances and the more options we have, the less room there is for God. You know, previous generations didn't have a problem believing in God or believing that there was an eternity because life was so hard for thousands and thousands of years. Life was very hard. You had to work your fingers to the bone just to survive. Today, if you work your fingers to the bone, it's usually just to keep up with the Joneses, right? So we don't have that understanding. You even have Christians that aren't looking forward to eternity because of everything's so good. I'm just trying to make everything good here. I'm scared about heaven. That's weird. Eee. I mean, how, back, how backwards is that? To think, I don't know if I want to go to heaven to be with Jesus, even though I'm a Christian, because that's scary and I don't understand it because life is so good here. If you were having to work the fields every day, all day long, and only being able to eat once or twice a week, we'd be looking forward to heaven. Like, get me out of here. I'm ready to go to that big banquet, that big feast where there's all the food I can eat. But because we have it so good here, it can make it more difficult to really go all in with God. And we know life is tough here too, but we still have so many things that can take the place of really having outrageous faith. So listen, we are called to outrageous faith. But there are some perks that I, want, that I think James shares in the first chapter of James that I'd like to give you today that I think We'll encourage you, but also challenge you. And the first one is that we get to experience the joy of trials. I didn't say we get to experience trials. Everybody gets to experience trials. But you actually get to experience joy in the trials when you are a doer of the word, when you are all in on Jesus. The passage is out of uh, James 1, verse 2 to 4. Many of you know this passage. It says, consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let me tell you something. When he says to have joy, consider it joy whenever you face all these terrible trials in your life, that's crazy talk. That's crazy. Who wants to have joy in trials? You know what I wanted to say? Consider it pure joy because your trials are gonna end. Not in the trial. He says to do it in the trial. That's crazy talk, church. But he says you can have joy in the trial. Repeat after me. I can have joy in the trial. You're all crazy. <laughs> I set you up for failure there. But it's true. He says we can all, but it, it sounds crazy. But you know what? You know who it's not crazy to? The person that's all in. The person that's a doer of the word the person that's looking intently into the word, the person that's continuing to remember what they've heard and they're not forgetting and they are submitted to God and they're blessed in what they do, that is the person that can have joy in the trial. But I can tell you, if you're a mutual fund Christian, you're wasting your time. You will not have consistent joy in trials if you are compartmentalizing and diversifying your faith. We don't get to just not, not live and trust God in our life in this area, but then something comes up and we need his help, so we just claim this verse. Name it and claim it. I can have joy in trials. That's what I'm, I'm claiming it for me, Lord. When the Lord's saying, well, you're not even submitted to me in that. Because the joy comes from being submitted to him. 
The joy is reserved for those who are submitted to him, church. You don't get to sit up on your perch and do your thing and be, put your faith in yourself and expect him to just plop some joy into your life. The joy is reserved for those who are all in, who have given themselves to him. And this should be the goal for us as believers, that we would even see the trials in our life as an opportunity for us to grow closer to God. That's my prayer. That really is my prayer. I could say that transparently up here. When I go through stuff, I very rarely ask God to take it away. I ask him to help me see the joy, to see his purpose in it. Because I don't want to pray for him to get rid of it because then my focus is just on getting through the trial and getting past it so it can be a thing in my history. But I want to know what he's teaching me in it. James says you can have joy in the trial, in the midst of it. But that's crazy talk if you're not there. The same crazy talk that says that it was for the joy set before him that Christ endured the cross. That's some crazy talk. Joy going to a cross? Oh, well, he's Jesus, so it wasn't as big a deal. He was fully human. He had all the nerve endings that you and I have. That crown on his head hurt. The nails in his feet and hands hurt. The spear in his side hurt. Having his beard pulled out hurt. Being whipped on his back hurt. Yet for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He had joy in that moment. That's crazy unless you're fully submitted to who God is and what he has for you in your life. And the idea of joy is not about happiness in trials. It's not like, oh, thank you, God, that I'm going through this horrible health crisis. It's not happiness, it's contentment. Joy in trials is about being content in the trial, trusting God, knowing he has a purpose in it, knowing that you can trust him through it, knowing that he's still worthy and he's still faithful. And if we could all agree, we could all agree on one thing, everybody, in the room, listening online, every one of us wants contentment in life. There's not a person that doesn't want to be content. I don't need peace. I like turmoil and disruption in my life. Nobody says that. We all want to be content. The variable in it is how we pursue that contentment. Some of us try to get contentment by filling the voids of discontentment with stuff. You know, I'm discontent with my car because it's not nice enough, so if I buy a new car, I'll be more content. I'm discontent with my job and I'm not making enough money. So if I get a new job with good money, I'll be more content. And for those of us that have done that in our life, we know that it doesn't work because there, even though you can push out that discontentment for a hot minute, there's more discontentment just waiting to come in. There's always more discontentment. Sometimes it's in the same thing. Sometimes that car you just thought you bought because you thought it would make you content. It works for about 10 minutes and then you get that first monthly bill that comes in the mail and suddenly I'm not as content as I was because my last car was paid off. <laughs> now this car's got a payment. It, it doesn't work. God's intent for us to be content is completely different. It's not about getting rid of discontentment by filling voids. It's actually a, a secret to contentment that the word shows us. And that secret is reserved for those who are submitted to God. The Apostle Paul gives us this secret in Philippians 4. It's a very famous passage of scripture. We like to focus on verse 13 because it sounds really cool, but there's a couple of verses before it that speak to, speak, that clarify verse 13. We know that God's method to defeating discontentment is through trials. His method to defeating discontentment in your life is actually through trials. It's not to, it's not to just get rid of discontentment or give you whatever you need. It's to take you through trials and tests in your life. Paul says it pretty clearly. He says in verse 11, he says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And here's the verse we love. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. But the contentment comes through the trial. The contentment comes from being well-fed and being hungry, from being up and down, from having all I need and having nothing. The secret, what he's showing us here is that contentment doesn't come from having things. It doesn't come from acquiring things in life. It doesn't come from having it all. We know that's a fact. Some of the wealthiest people in all the world are some of the most discontent people in all the world. And some of the poorest people in the world are some of the most joyful people in the world. The stuff does not bring contentment. True contentment is only learned 
through the trials. That is how we get joy in the midst of the trials that James tells us we can have. All right, secondly, we can take pride in humble circumstances. More crazy talk. Who wants to, that sounds like an oxymoron. I'm pride in my humble circumstances. James 1, verse 9 to 11. It says, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. So what does that even mean? That the, the, uh, the believer in humble circumstances should take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their low position and their humiliation. To sum it up, it means that the rich should rejoice when they come to a place of needing God. And just FYI, we're all in the rich part of this verse. When 80% of the world lives on less than $10 a day, we're all rich, okay? So we should take pride when God brings us to a place that we see our need for him. And sometimes that means knocking us off of that place of richness, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, whether it's whatever it is, when we are brought to a place that we see our need for him, we should rejoice in that. And the same thing is for the poor, that they would rejoice because they know how much they need God. They're at, a, they're at an advantage because they see their great need for God. It's what I was saying earlier, that because of the society we live in, we're at a disadvantage, church. We're at a disadvantage in our faith because of how blessed we are as a society. Because we don't necessarily have to see our need for God as often. And so we should rejoice when God brings us into those places of trials and tests in our life so that we can see our great need for him. That's what James is telling us here. And I think there's a great example that I wanna kind of share for a few minutes just about the, a season in the life of David, the, the second king of Israel, the greatest king of Israel. From the time when he was first introduced in the Bible to the time he became king, he went through a lot. He started off very lowly. He was a little shepherd boy that was just out there with the sheep. In fact, his dad wouldn't even bring him into, into the lineup when Samuel came to anoint the next king of Israel. The da Jesse, his dad, didn't even think David would be in the list, so he didn't even bring him in. And he was at this very low position, but he honored God in that low position. We hear David say later that when, when he was tending his sheep, that when a bear or a lion would come to try to steal a sheep, he would kill the bear or lion and take the sheep back. He honored God in that. He took pride in his humble position of serving in that capacity. But then we know that he did get anointed king of Israel by Saul, and so he was the heir apparent. So he goes from being way down here to way up here. And he was in this place of richness in his life. He didn't have the money yet that came with being a king, but he was obviously, he was the heir apparent, so it was a big deal. He was gonna be the king of Israel. And he honored God from that position too. He fought hard for the king. He, he played the harp for the king to soothe him. He, the king loved him, brought him into his palace. Eventually though, the king got jealous of him and was threatened by him, so he puts a hit out on his life, and the king is going to kill David. So now David went from being up here to way down here again. And he honored God when he was way down here again. He served faithfully and honored God in all of that. In fact, we see in the scripture there's two different times that David could have killed Saul, and he didn't do it. One time Saul was in a cave, and he cut off a piece of his robe to show him later that I could have killed you, but I didn't. And the second time was even more powerful. And we see what God is doing in David's life here, and it's similar to what he does in our life. Some of the principles of this apply to us. So Saul is chasing David, trying to kill him, and he's in his camp with his men, and they're, they're fast asleep, they're out. And David and his men come upon them, and David walks into the camp with his men, and he is standing over Saul, the man that's been chasing him and trying to kill him. Standing over him, he could end all of this right now. And let's see what happens here in uh, 1 Samuel 28, starting in verse eight. One of his men, Abishai, is standing there with him. And Abishai said to David, today God has delivered the enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't strike him twice. Ooh, that had to feel good for David. That guy's gonna take care of this, right? This needless suffering, this unjustified trial could be over right now, David. And no one in all of Israel will begrudge you. Most of the people hated Saul by now. But what did he do? Look at the next verse. It says, David said to Abishai, don't destroy him. 
Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As sure as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him or his time will come and he will die or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his head and let's go. That is what taking the lowly position, the humility and the pride in the lowly position looks like. He would not take matters into his own hands. He was the anointed king of Israel it was God's plan for him to be king, yet he refused to take matters into his own hands. He was fully submitted to God. He was a doer of the word. He was continuing in his faith. He was focused. He was not forgetting the word that had been spoken over him, that he was gonna be the king of Israel. So he did not take matters into his own hand because he was honoring the word because the word also said to honor the king. So he was not gonna dishonor his king by killing him, even though physically speaking and in human terms, he would have had the right to do it. And he would have been honored for it. He would not do it. That's what it looks like, church. Not taking it into our own hands, but being fully submitted to God in every and any situation, even in the midst of a trial, even in the midst of an unnecessary trial. And can I tell you in our trials that God tests us a lot more than we realize? He tests us all the time. I, we probably are privy to about 2% of the tests God brings into our life. He is a God that tests us. And it's for good reason, to build that contentment in our life. And you know how we know that this was a test for David? Because of the very next verse. Look what it said, verse 12. So David took the spear and the water jug near Saul's head and they left. No one saw or knew about it, nor did anyone wake up. They were all sleeping, why? Because the Lord put them in a deep sleep. Ooh, that sounds like entrapment, Lord. He made sure they wouldn't wake up so that if they wanted to, they could walk right up and end this. God was testing David and he tests us. Now, I'm thankful for the grace of God because we mess it up all the time. Thank you for his forgiveness. Thank you that we, I'm so thankful that, that he doesn't judge us, he doesn't condemn us. We don't miss out on our purpose in life because we miss or we, we don't respond well to the tests but we also need to be aware of it. We can take humility, we can take pride in those humble positions because we know God is working. Church, that is life-changing for us when we get that in here and in here. That it is, it is life-changing when we understand I don't have to grumble and complain, I don't have to whine about everything, I don't have to try to fix everything in my life, I can stay true to the word, I can be a doer of the word, I can focus on God, I can continue in what he's called me to do, I can stand on his truth, I can wise up, even when it's difficult and unpleasant, and I can trust my God, and he is worthy of it. He deserves it, he's worthy, he's faithful. Sometimes we limit the faithfulness of God because we get our hands in it. We wanna drive that spear down through Saul's head. And God's saying, just leave it, I'm gonna take care of it. And he sure did, didn't he? He sure did, and David was able to keep his hands perfectly clean through that whole thing. All right, third and finally, we'll finish with this. You're no longer a victim to your temptations. Praise God, praise God. Man, temptation is a giant in our life. And James tells us it's a big deal. Just because we're saved, if you're a follower of Jesus, doesn't mean you don't have any temptations. It doesn't mean you don't fall into them. It doesn't mean you don't get enticed. In fact, James 1.13, let's read it. When tempted, no one should say, now listen, when tempted, so we're tempted. No one should say God is tempting me for God cannot be tempted by evil nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it's full grown gives birth to death. So as a follower of Jesus, you are not excluded from being tempted. This is a letter to the church and he's saying each person is tempted. The good news is you're not alone in being tempted. The bad news is he tells us it's by our own evil desires. So your own self is against yourself. <laughs> you don't need enemies outside because you have plenty right in here. It's our own nature that entices us into the temptations that come our way. This is why we can feel like a helpless victim to our temptations because it's coming from us. And it, we talk ourselves into the, this is a good thing. And there's so many areas in life where we can have this challenge. A very superficial one would just be the temptation of sugar. 
There's times I feel like I'm helpless. And it's really just my own evil desires. They don't feel evil at the time. They feel very godly. But, but listen, temptations are not there. It's not just something that just comes from the enemy that's meant to destroy you. Temptations come from you, and it's not, it doesn't even have to destroy you. It doesn't have to destroy your faith. It can actually build your faith. Because every time you have a little victory over temptation, your faith grows. You get a little bit stronger in that faith. The more we resist the temptations and we're not, we're not given to them, we're not victims of our temptations, our faith gets a little bit stronger. But again, this is reserved for people who are doers of the word. If you're a mutual fund Christian and you've just got a little bit of going everywhere and you're trying to resist temptation, you're, you're fighting a bad uphill battle. It's for those that are committed to the Lord, that are able to see that this temptation is not worth it. To see that I don't have to be enticed by my own evil desires. I don't have to be pulled away. I can focus on him. I can remember him and not forget who he is in my life. It doesn't mean you win every time there's a temptation. But you're not a victim of them. And you can actually grow through them. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12. And I'll finish with this. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it, so that you can persevere through it. You know, this is one of those verses that's taken out of context. God will never give you more than you can handle. Not true. He actually is very, very prominent in giving you more than you can handle (laughs) because he doesn't want you to be able to handle it on your own. He wants you to have to lean on him. He says, be careful so that you do not fall. You know how you don't fall when you're walking? You be careful. Anybody remember the ice storm of, what was that, 2014? If you went out during that, walked on your driveway, I promise you, you were very careful. And can I tell you today, the life of faith is like walking on a sheet of ice because we are prone to give in to temptations. We are prone to be distracted. Life is not a nice newly paved sidewalk that's clean and you got on your brand new kicks. It is a sheet of ice and you're wearing flip flops, okay? We have to be careful so that we do not fall. God will provide a way out for us. We can turn the tables on the temptations in our life. I know there's times that we can even see the way out sometimes and we still don't take it. God forgive us for those times and he does. And we praise him for his faithfulness in our life. But the idea is that we are not victims of the temptations that come upon us in our life. But we have to be all in. We have to put our, we have to put our eggs in that one basket. We have to take the plunge. We have to not just dip our toes in, but be all committed to who he is in our life and giving him access to every area of our life, not just the certain ones that we pick and choose. James says, wise up. He's telling us, church, wise up. Remember what you've learned. Remember what you've heard. Understand what you've heard and believe it, even if it is unpleasant or difficult. Would you stand with me this morning, this afternoon? Listen, I'm gonna invite you to the altar. We're gonna pray today. If you wanna declare today that you're gonna wise up, and this does not mean you're just some horrible person that needs to get get right with God. It just means I'm committing today that I am going to remember I'm gonna understand who he is and what he's done for me, even when it's difficult or unpleasant. And I'm committing today to be all in. I'm done diversifying my faith, I'm done diversifying my commitments in life, and it's gonna be about him. Come on, let's pray. Don't wait, wait. we'll wait a few more seconds, but I I wanna pray for us, because I believe that God wants to do a work in our heart, church. This is the challenge, this is the challenge for all of us. And I'm in, I'm in full time and then some ministry. And it's a challenge for me. The heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. It is beyond cure. The only thing that can change our heart is the Holy Spirit of God. And he can move in our midst. He can move in us. He can transform us. He can help us to remember. He can help us to focus. He can help us to not forget. He can help us to make him our priority. That's a prayer he wants to answer for all of us. That he would be our first focus.
that we would wise up. Praise God. Church, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. Your word is truth. Your word is life. Your word is what transforms us by the power of your spirit. Lord, we ask in this moment that the power of your spirit would move inside of us. God, where our thinking has been bad, would you help us to shift that thinking? Lord, where we have diversified our faith like we do our money, God, would you forgive us? Lord, we stand, church, for those of you at the altar this morning, this afternoon, I just encourage you in your own way just to repent of whatever you need to repent of. Lord, we repent for being diversified. We repent for looking at you as a a genie in a bottle or dipping our toes in the water or taking our faith on a test drive. God, we want to be all in. We want to be all in on you today, Lord. You are the only one that gives us purpose. There is no purpose outside of you, Jesus. Would you help us to see that everything else is shifting sand? The only firm foundation is you. God, help us to look at everything in our life through the prism of our faith and who you are, Lord. Help us, Lord. We want to be doers of the word today. We want to be doers of the word, that we will do what it says. We will not just hear it, but it will become a part of our life in every aspect, that it will be with us on Monday morning all the way through to Sunday. And God, the people in our life will know that we have outrageous faith, not to be abrasive or combative, Lord, but they will see that we have put our trust in you in every area, Lord, where we have not trusted you with our finances, God, would you forgive us? Lord, where we have not trusted you in our relationships, would you forgive us, God? Where we have not trusted you in our health, would you forgive us, Lord? Where we have not trusted you in our emotions, would you forgive us, God? Where we have looked to fill the void in other places, God, we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the oceans of grace that you have, Lord, that your word is faithful and true, that you are faithful, that when we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. God, thank you for a cleansing today. We receive it in the name of Jesus. We love you, Lord. God, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice that doesn't know who you are, has not given their life to you, God. Lord, that you would pierce our hearts today. Lord, that we would be determined to look forward to an eternity with you. If you are here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there is no complicated plan Become a, becoming a follower of Jesus. It is literally about understanding that you cannot do this on your own, that you are not good enough to make it to heaven on your own, that you are a sinner in need of a savior, which is what every one of us are. And you put your faith in Jesus. You, you trust him to forgive you of your sins. You are determined not to live your life on your own anymore, but to live it inside him and to let him be the Lord of your life. If you do that, you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. And your name is written in the Lamb's book of life to be with him for eternity. And no matter what happens in this world, whether, whether you live through trials your whole life, this is just the preamble to the real life that comes after this life ends. So don't leave this place without doing that today, God. God, we thank you so much for each and every person here today. We love you, Lord. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place. You are faithful. All my life, you have been faithful. All our lives, you have been so, so good. We will sing and speak of the mercy of God forever and ever. You deserve it, Lord. God, just give us a glimpse, more of a glimpse of who you are. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen. God bless you.